Day two, BCM East. And today's keynote speaker is David All. David was the uh, founder of Creative Computing Magazine. And uh, he spoke here, um, I guess, two years ago? Three years ago? Three. Three years ago. And it was funny, three years ago we had about six speakers, and we filled them all equally. Nobody was listed as a keynote. And everyone just kind of assumed he was a keynote. People just started saying, oh, I went to your keynote, because we didn't have one. It's David All. Okay. And ever since that day, People have been telling us, you've got to bring him back, you've got to bring him back, it's great. So, we obliged David All. After that kind of build-up, I don't know. Um, you don't usually see me in a tie. Uh, in fact, I, I think of all the years I worked for Creative Computing, uh, probably it was only a few conferences where I had a tie. But anyway, I, I just came from church. Um, I did. I did. You know, I don't think it's a foreign concept to some of you. Uh, but I have to tell you a religious joke since I just came from church. Uh, there was a, a really terrible uh, automobile accident, and uh, in the accident, there was a, a teacher driving a little Honda and a garbage man driving a, a garbage truck, and a, and a lawyer probably driving a high end Mercedes Benz. And uh, anyway, they all uh, appeared at, uh, at uh, St. Peter at the gates, and, and heaven was getting pretty, pretty full. Uh, so he really didn't have any room. So he said, well, okay, we're, we're, we're adopting a new uh, procedure now. Yeah, you, there's going to be a little quiz in order to get into heaven. So he asked, he said, well, teacher, that's, that's a good person. We, we could welcome a teacher into heaven. So he asked well, the teacher, what, what was, what's the name of that famous ship that went down in the Atlantic that was supposed to be uh, totally, uh, you know, immune from an iceberg or anything else? And he said, oh, that was a Titanic. And yes, yes, it was. Okay, the door is open. You go ahead and enter. Well, we don't need any garbage men in heaven. So he said, well, to the garbage man, well, okay, that was, that was the right answer, the Titanic. How many people were on it? He doesn't have a clue. He says, well, 3,482. That was it. There were. So he says, well, okay, you're, you're in too. And to the lawyer, well, we definitely don't need any more lawyers. So he said um, to the lawyer, uh, what were their names? <laughs> okay, what has that got to do with computing? Um, it's kind of, uh, and we're going to get into that. Uh, it, it's kind of um, related to operating systems. Uh, one or two or three operating systems, probably okay. But when you get beyond that, and when you get beyond three lawyers, it makes trouble for all of us. And I think we're going to see how, how that uh, uh, comes to pass. Now, the, the, my subject today is, is bloopers and, and mistakes and, and, and errors, uh, some of which were perhaps obvious at the time, at the time that they were made, uh, back in the 70s, 80s. Others, uh, I'm looking back with hindsight, with 2020 hindsight from 2009, and saying, well, this was obviously a mistake, but perhaps back in 1976 or 1980, it didn't appear to be one. So there's sort of two kinds of, of, of bloopers uh, here that we're going to be talking about. And, and by the way, before I, uh, before I get, get on to that, if you don't mind me making a another kind of side announcement. Um, you were talking about Delaware. You know the greatest thing about Delaware? They have the annual pumpkin chunkin' championships in Delaware. And if you've never been to a pumpkin chunkin', you ought to go. It's as close to vintage computing as, as you can get, but they, boy, they're, they're, they're lobbing eight pound pumpkins almost a mile with these various uh, devices. And if you look at these devices, the trebuchets and the uh, air cannons and everything else, I mean, this is, this is uh, vintage computing uh, in, in the rough. Uh, go down to a pumpkin chunk and uh, when, when is it? The end of this, uh, end of uh, October, right? In um, yeah yeah or, 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 or. yeah down in uh, Bethel or whatever <laughs> uh, anyway. put it on your calendar. Um, 
future. Okay, one, one other thing also related to, to what you said uh, about the uh, Philadelphia Computer Music Festival. Uh, at Creative Computing, we made a record. You remember those things, the black vinyl? Uh, we made a 12-inch record of the first computing, uh, first Philadelphia Computer Music Festival. Uh, obviously, it's out of print. But I was thinking of uh, making, re-releasing it as a, uh, a CD. Um, I know that's still one generation earlier, but you know I can do it um, with with my uh, hardware. Uh, if there's any interest uh, afterwards, you know, or, or or you know, raise your hand now if there's any interest in it. Oh, okay, maybe we'll, we'll, would, would this be I'll, I'll digitally remastered? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, it was digital in the first place, but then it went to analog, which, yeah, I know, we lost a lot. Uh, and then there was the flutist who was playing along. The computer was uh, had the background. The flutist was playing along, and he lost his breath. Well, and he took a very deep breath and, and missed about five measures in the middle of, of a box suite. Uh, but it, and it's all on the record, because um, we didn't have a second chance. But anyway, interesting, that little thing. Um, also, uh, I didn't bring any of my uh, computers down here uh, that I have, uh, uh, but I am downsizing. I'm getting rid of stuff. Uh, my, my website is totally out of control. I've got 12,000 pages on my website, uh, a lot of stuff for sale, mostly stamp collection uh, and that kind of thing, but old magazines. Um, but I have some computers. Uh, I, uh, an original IMSI, I did sell the Altair, uh, Commodore PET, a lot, a lot of the early stuff. Um, if there's any interest, um, uh, see me afterwards, I'll give you a business card, you can get on my, my little mailing list for that. Uh, okay, let's get into uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm being paid to talk about today. Um, ha. <laughs> anyway. I'm talking about bloopers, so, uh, bloopers, mistakes, errors over the first, and I'm, I'm going to limit this to 10 years, uh, the, the, the first 10 years of personal computing, 1974 uh, to 84. Um, okay, 1974, obviously there was nothing out at that time. Uh, you, you all saw the, uh, the slide of the... Uh, uh, radio electronics cover of uh, the, what was the name of that computer? The, the Mark, 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 Mark 8. Yeah, that was uh, uh, appeared on their cover in July of, of 74. Uh, a kit, the first and, and only uh, computer. But, uh, you know, it wasn't, in a sense, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to say it wasn't serious, but uh, it really had a, a pretty limited uh, appeal. Um, anyway, a few months before that came out, however, uh, I was at Digital Equipment. I was, uh, for several years, I was uh, heading up the uh, educational products group at Digital. And we were the ones that if somebody, some engineer or somebody wanted to buy a computer, we were the ones in the educational group that had to sell it because we were providing uh, service and support at the very lowest possible level and individuals were considered needing more service and support than, than uh, companies. So occasionally, you know, probably every three months or so, I'd sell a PDP-8 to some engineer that had some money in his pocket and wanted to buy one. Um, and it, I had one at home. I was using a PDPA-F uh, at, at home, and it was a lot of fun with an ASR33 teletype, you know about that, oiled uh, paper tape and everything. Um, and um, so in uh, 1973, I moved out of the education product group over to an advanced development group at Digital. And we developed two really nice, compact computers. The PDP-8A, based on, on the PDP-8 and a Western Digital chipset uh, that um, was uh, basically had, a, it was not uh, a, a processor on a chip, but it was a, a set of chips that uh, 
basically emulated the vacuum tubes that were in uh, some of the other computers or the discrete components that were in the others. And it, it basically just made it more compact is all it did. This is about four inches high. It's the usual rack mounted thing, 19 inches wide. Uh, but if you take, just take the board out of that, it's a lot smaller. That's all it is, there's a board in there. Um, and uh, of course the memory boards, well, that's something else again. But we did take the board out. We made it a little bit smaller than that. And then if you, next slide, mounted it under, uh, hit the next one, thank you. Under, a, uh, sorry, not too much detail there, under the VTA, VTO5 video terminal. And it was, a, it was kind of a cumbersome package, but it was a nice, nice looking little package. And um, anyway, it, uh, it was a single board computer. Now the disadvantage of the PDP-8A uh, is that, uh, well, and, and most of the mini computers, is you needed some way of getting programs in and out of them. So what we did is we took a little uh, teletype uh, uh, paper tape reader, uh, you know, the oil paper tape and made that, a, a, put it in a little box. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it, but it's a separate peripheral. And basically that was, was a computer. Uh, the, the PDP-8, the video terminal, and, and the uh, paper tape reader punch. Um, and we figured we could sell it for about $4,000. It's a lot of money, but nevertheless, it's a lot cheaper than a PDP-8 with the ASR-33, the cheapest configuration we had of the PDP-8E with an ASR-33 was $6,500 at that time. So $4,000 was, was coming down. Uh, the other one we developed was much more interesting. Sorry, I don't have a picture of it. It's a PDP-11. The 11 had just come out. That's a 16-bit computer. The 8, of course, you know, is a 12-bit computer. Um, so the 11 uh, had just, they had also developed a single board computer, again, with Western Digital Chips. And we had a, a really nice one that was on an even smaller board that could be packaged in kind of a large uh, attache case. And our Swiss uh, uh, research lab of DEC had developed this thing that they called a floppy disk. Well, they didn't call it a floppy disk, but it was a, and it was not a size that you've ever seen. It was about nine inches uh, uh, square. And uh, so, you know, we eventually, of course, came out with the eight inch one, but this was a little bit bigger one, but it fit into that same attache case. So we had a floppy disk and the, the single board computer and uh, again, a, a terminal, but, uh, but a, even a smaller terminal, but a small screen, uh, smaller than this, that all the whole thing folded up into this large lawyer size attache case. That one we figured we could sell for about $5,000. And it, it was, it was a, a useful computer. And that was with a single deck tape drive. Anybody remember what deck tape was? Deck tape is basically uh, similar to nine track mag tape, except the, the little reels uh, are about uh, five and a half inches in diameter. So very- There's a couple in the exhibit hall. Pardon? There's a couple in the exhibit hall. Okay, great, okay. But they're all dual ones, right? Yeah. They're all dual. Okay, this was a single one, uh, which, well, anyway, took a, took a lot of uh, arm twisting to, uh, to develop that, uh, or to you know, say that we might market it. Brought these two computers to the operations committee meeting. I remember this. Uh, I mean, I this is this is just in in my my brain because it was on my birthday, May seventeenth, nineteen seventy four. May seventeenth, before there before the radio electronics, before anything else. Set them two of them down. We had them operating, working. The operations committee at DEC was uh, the operational managers from the different uh, groups, finance, production, marketing, so on. And they were split 50-50. 50% said, yeah, wow, let's bring it out. And of course, 50% of finance people said, oh, you know, can't possibly do this. That doesn't make any sense. Nobody's going to buy it. So it came down to Ken Olson to make the decision. Do we bring out the computer? And of course, many of you have read what he said. 
He repeated it two years later at the World Future Society convention in Boston. There is no reason that anybody needs a computer of their own at home. <laughs> no reason. Now, in all fairness to Ken, he was thinking, hey, uh, you can hook up to a PDP-10 through a nice, reliable telephone modem and uh, have access to a big mainframe and all kinds of computing power. And you know, why on earth would you want a 4K, uh, you know, tiny little PDP-8 or 11 uh, in your home? So you know, it wasn't, in a sense, a wrong decision. But it was the wrong decision. <laughs> if digital had built either one of those, they would have absolutely owned the personal computer market. They would have owned it. Altair, Apple, the others wouldn't have had a chance. I mean, they, <laughs> so they didn't. And so, so we move on. We move on to the Altair, right? Announced in uh, early 75, Kit Permits, uh, uh, featured on the cover of, uh, of Radio Electronics. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with the Altair. I mean, I, I like it. I had one. I built one. Uh, they, they had expectations of selling three or 400 of them. They sold 2,000 of them in the first uh, couple of months. They started shipping only the bare bones kit instead of uh, everything that people had or ordered. You know, there's a lot of... A lot of issues with the with the Altair. But now here's the interesting thing. Les Solomon and Alt Art Salzberg, who were the editors of, uh, of Popular Electronics at the time, said, nobody's going to buy this thing unless there is, and they, they didn't call it a killer app, but that's what they were saying, is we really need a, a, an application that's going to cause people to buy the computer. What do you suppose Les Solomon's idea of the killer app was? Well, remember anybody remember Harry Garland and uh, Roger Mellon, from, who eventually formed Cremenco? Well, they came to uh, Popular Electronics with an idea. Well, they, they, they had actually written another article about a, a Cyclops camera that they had uh, developed. Uh, hit, the, hit the slide, I'll show you. And that's uh, the board that the Cyclops was, was on. And they said, hey, this can be run on a computer. And a computer can run a security camera. And that's the killer app. And Les Solomon said, yeah, that's the killer app. And um, basically, that's what popular electronics, everybody remembers the, the January issue, don't you? Anybody remember the April and May issues where they were featuring the, the well, it was not called Cremenco at the time, but the Cyclops camera, security camera for your Altair. And that's going to make your Altair come alive. How many of the 2,000 people that ordered an Altair in the first six months do you think were buying it because of its, its use as a security camera? Zero? Maybe one? Two? <laughs> Not very many. Wasn't exactly a killer app. Uh, by the way, the, the, remember, anybody remember the price for a bare bones Altair back then? Three ninety-seven. Yeah, four four hundred. Um, okay, then then we had uh, uh, the the first uh, World Altair Computer Convention, March uh, nineteen seventy-six. Uh, Ed Roberts, uh, president of MITS, he welcomed. Uh, Chromemco, because you know they had been featured in Popular Electronics, he welcomed them with open arms. Uh, Harry Garland and and, and Roger, uh, they were the only group that was uh, the only company that was invited to be at the convention. A lot of other companies were there who were making stuff for the Altair, but they were showing their stuff in hotel rooms and you know kind of you know, look at look at what I got here uh, type of thing. Um, they were not uh, officially uh, invited to the convention. In fact, Ed Roberts denounced those firms in the MITS newsletter as parasites. <laughs> as a result of which, two guys named their S100 board company Parasitic Engineering. <laughs> uh, now, if, if Ed Roberts and MITS had just welcomed open architecture, 
had welcomed the other manufacturers. I, I, they might still be here today, but they, they basically elected to push them all away. We're going to make it. If, if it can be made for the Altair, we're going to make it. We're not, forget about these other guys. We're making more reliable memory. We're making static memory in the eight days of dynamic memory and you know, all the other, uh, the other stuff. Um, okay, next one. Oh, they, oh they, there's an MSI. Okay, I'm sorry. I was on one slide behind. Hit, hit the next one. Later in 76, uh, <clears throat> a couple of companies announced uh, computers uh, that were using this new uh, Motorola chip, the 60, uh, 6800. That's the Southwest Technical Products, SWTP um, chip. Uh, Sphere was the other one. Remember Sphere in Bountiful, Utah? Uh, had a, a very nice looking uh, computer about uh, around the uh, 6800. So now, what does Ed Roberts, president of MITS, say? Ooh, this is a threat. This is a threat. We've got to have a 6800 uh, computer too. So what they do, they announce the 680B, the, the Altair 680B, uh, and, and for $293. And it just spread the resources of, of, of Altair bits just so thin. I mean, there was no way they could support the 8080, support the, uh, the S100 machines, and the 680. Uh, I mean, in, in retrospect, one of the worst decisions they, they made. If they had just stuck to their, their expertise, and uh, they, they, well, again, I don't say that they'd be around today, but they would have lasted a lot longer uh, than they did. Um, the the MSI, which we showed before, I had them out of order. Sorry, uh, had had actually taken the the market uh, by storm. I mean, the MSI was a, basically an Altair, but uh, much better uh, uh, design, a uh, little, little higher quality control. And um, anyway, then who should design this new single board computer that he showed at the Homebrew Computer Club in California? Was Steve Wozniak. Now, what do you does anybody know that he also took that single board computer to his employer at the time? Hewlett Packard, right? And what they say now, this is now remember, digital was back in 74, this is 76. These computers have been selling for a while now. So, what did, what did HP say? There's no market for this. There's no market for, for a, a personal computer. So his deck, his HP, the leading manufacturers of, of many computers, both said, no, 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 there's no market for these, these little microcomputers. Um, uh, well, oh, okay, that's, that's the, uh, that is the Apple one. That's the single board. This is the board. Uh, that's the top of the case, uh, you know, closes down. And, and there's a keyboard there, but the keyboard is pretty standard. In fact, you see a lot of pictures of the Apple I that look like an Apple II because it's showing the, the keyboard, but that's really the Apple I is that, that board. And, and, and in a sense, the Apple II and Apple I were, were very uh, similar uh, products. Um, so now we've got the, the S100, we've got the Apple, we've got the 6800, and, and uh, you know things are getting kind of the loot uh, around. Go to the next uh, next slide. Here's here's a, an example of, of just this uh, dilution. Um, you you showed one. This is the uh, the Pro 80 made by ProTech up in uh, Montreal. Uh, it's a um, it's basically uh, was described as an S100 trainer. It was a single board Z80 based uh, computer. Had one single expansion slot uh, right up there at the top, and you could plug in a board, and you could what? What could you do with it? Well, you could diagnose problems with the board. <laughs> could you run a program? Well, no. But now, how how many of these things do you think there was a market for? Uh, not very many. There are a lot of other products like that that people came out with that, you know, you say, well, it's good for you, but, you know, are you, is there a market? No, there really, really isn't. Uh, and then you had all these small companies saying, well, we got it. We got the next greatest, best thing. Like, 
loving grace computers and Kentucky Fried computers. You know, it's, it's one thing to build a good product. It's another thing to name it. <laughs> and I mean, loving grace cybernetics. Uh, this is this was a, a, a very very smart guy. That was started by Lee Felsenstein, designer of the uh, the processor technology solve. This is a bright guy. But you don't name your company Loving Grace Cybernetics and expect to get any money from venture capitalists or, or Wall Street. Kentucky Fried Computers? Come on, give me a break. Even even Morrow's Micro Stuff. I mean, I bet you many of you have bought a Morrow's board, but you don't call your company Micro Stuff uh, or Peanut Butter Computing. For come on, give me a break. Um, along with that, we have. Cassette tape for mass storage. Well, okay, maybe those those newfangled floppy disks might uh, catch on someday, but they were so darn expensive. This happened to be the uh, at Creative Computing. Hey, we had to get on the bandwagon too. We had a little separate division called Sensational Software, and uh, this was our tape duplicator. We were making making tapes and, and selling them, and with that kind of reliability. You know, uh, it wasn't much of a, it wasn't the market. I, I don't want to say any more about that. Um, okay, there we go. There's a winner, right? <laughs> Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1, it was a winner. Um, now, how many of you remember, did that have an upper and lower case? No, it didn't. You know why it didn't? It saved a dollar fifty in manufacturing cost to not put lower case on. Dollar, maybe five dollars at retail. Ah, what are you thinking? What on earth are you thinking? By the way, I, I must confess. That, yeah. Hey, did the first pets have have lower case? No, they didn't. Did the first apple? No, it didn't. Everybody was saving that buck and a half in manufacturing costs. Ah, uh, yes, comment. I think there's a defect in the character generating chip. If you send it lower, then the character generating chip is cheaper also. But they won't do that. Could well, could well be, but I mean, it, it just, you know, without lowercase, you're just not going to have the serious applications that. The, you need. Well, that, yeah. I think the comment on the Apple II, they did, but instead of a lower case, they had like a bleeding uppercase letter. Yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. But, but, but they created the market for third party products to give you lower cases. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. That, uh, that's very true. Um, so, anyway, by the way, uh, retail price of the first TRS 80 Model 1, just the basic machine. No, no, no. Either. Three ninety nine, three ninety nine. Um, about the same as today, right? About the same as today. Prices haven't changed much. Okay, oh, I'm going to skip forward a couple of years. May 1980, Apple II introduced uh, in '78, huge success. Then a bunch of Apple II clones. Uh, we mentioned the Franklin Ace and uh, the Unitron, the CI Base, uh, well, there are a couple of others. Uh, and then came what? The oh, Apple III. Wow. <laughs> oh, come on. The monstrously unreliable Apple III. Uh, we had one of the very first ones at, uh, at Creative Computing, and you know we were trying to, well, we were trying to keep it going for more than an hour or so at a time. Um, <laughs> It had a bad connector, number one, which they did have a, what in those days, or what today we would call a recall. Uh, in those days, they informed customers that, uh, by the way, you have a bad connector, and, uh, and uh, gee, uh, well, maybe we have a fix. Um, but uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't offering to take them back and, and, and fix it up. Uh, so it, it, was, it was really a shame because uh, it might have been a success, but the, the unreliability uh, factor there. Um, all right, now a story that uh, we probably all know, but we may not know actually what happened. Let me hit the next uh, slide if you would. 
digital research. That's Gary Kildall and, and uh, Dorothy, uh, uh, Dorothy McEwen. Um, you know, the story is that, uh, which was actually uh, put out by Bill Gates, is that uh, Gary was off flying when IBM wanted to make a, a, a deal with them for a CPM. You know, because IBM had come to Microsoft and uh, they liked the, the looks of uh, uh, this uh, computer uh, running uh, uh, BASIC and uh, wanted to get the BASIC and they wanted the operating system. And Bill Gates said, well, had to say, well, you know, really it's not ours to sell. And this guy down in uh, San Mateo, uh, Gary Kildall, his company owns, owns that. So IBM goes down there to see him with their chief of non-disclosure. You know, we're not going to talk to you until you sign this non-disclosure agreement. And it was actually, and here's where lawyers come in, it was actually... Uh, Jerry Davis, who was Digital Research's outside lawyer, who said, oh, you shouldn't sign this. You should not, this, this restricts you way too much. And so Gary and Dorothy said, no, no, we're not going to sign this non-disclosure agreement. And so what did IBM do? Turn around, go back to Seattle and say, Bill, you know, we, we, we can't make a deal with these guys because they're, they're not willing to sign our, our agreement here. And, and what can you do? So Bill turns to, uh, to these two guys up at Seattle Computer Products and makes a deal with them for how much? Yeah. To buy their operating system that he makes then look very much like CPM. Not quite, but close enough. And the IBM was uh, was okay with that. Renamed it uh, Microsoft uh, DOS, MS DOS eventually. And um, so, I mean, and then Bill put out the the story. Well, Gary was out flying and he couldn't bother meeting with him. But uh, it's actually a lawyer that, that caused that. I don't want to say bad things about Gary. I guess you all know Gary died a number of years ago, uh, 1994, in a. Anybody know? Bar, bar, bar fight. Bar fight? Yeah. I thought he was drunk over there. He was a bar fight. There's also a story that I slipped off the stool, look at his head. Yeah, he, he hit his head in a fight. It was, I mean, it was in, in a bar fight. But anyway. Um, okay. So let's let's move on. Now the big companies are getting in the act. You, you pointed that out. The big big guns are, are coming in. Uh, uh, IBM isn't quite in it yet, although they've now made this agreement with Bill Gates that their uh, their little organization down in Florida developed this thing that they thought, well, maybe we can sell a couple of of, of these guys uh, uh, these personal computer things. Um, and, but they did want to do it right, and, and they were doing it right. But who was the other big player? Xerox. Xerox. There, there is their entry. The Xerox 820. The internal code name for the Xerox 820 at Xerox was the worm. Why the worm? Because the worm was designed to eat Apple. <laughs> it was going to eat Apple's market. Uh, very rugged system, a CPM system. Uh, it was one of the first systems that could support uh, hard disks, uh, could support uh, an eight inch floppy as shown here, or, or this newfangled five and a quarter inch floppy, but expensive. Uh, you know, remember why I said digital's uh, machine that we could have brought out was gonna be four or $5,000? That's what this was. And in those days, of, of Altair's costing five or six hundred, or maybe a well equipped one, twelve hundred dollars, five thousand dollars just didn't fly, uh, could not fly in, in the market. So, um, so the, the 820, um, maybe it was bought by some of Xerox's uh, uh, copier customers, but it certainly didn't uh, take the, the computer market uh, for storm by storm. Um, 1982, one year later. Okay, now, now IBM has come out with their, their machine, uh, but uh, people haven't gotten on this idea of making IBM clones quite yet. Uh, there were a few of them that were starting, 
But the, these uh, portable computers, these sewing book uh, uh, size uh, portables that had, had really kind of caught on, the Osborne 1, the K-Pro 2, uh, and this one, the Zorba. Whoa, what a computer. Um, and uh, the very forgettable Byte uh, Hyperion, or Bytech uh, Hyperion, and there were a bunch of these things. And you know what? Again, what did they have that that uh, you know Osborne and the others didn't have? Eh, a different operating system, a different something or other, and without you know this was the time where the market is getting bigger, and we really have to look towards some kind of standardization. And it's it's beyond the days where you, each manufacturer can have their own uh, their own different operating system. Um, so anyway, they didn't make, okay, here's an interesting little thing. This was an, an article appeared in, uh, uh, I don't recall what magazine, 1983, David Nimmons wrote this and he ridiculed these applications. Now here I'm taking hindsight, right? In 83, these were ridiculous applications for your home computer. Now, what, Okay, electronic cookbook, yeah, maybe hasn't caught on, but I'll tell you what, my wife gets a lot of recipes from the internet. Um, speech synthesis, we're not quite there yet. Probably another 10 years, somebody's gonna take a look at that and say, who, who, what do you mean they're really ridiculing speech synthesis? It's the main way that we get things in and out of the computer. Yeah. Everything else, it's here, it's here. Maybe home control, yeah, not, not quite, but, uh, it's, it's perhaps a mistake to ridicule things uh, too soon, too soon. Um, by the way, there's a, there was a very popular book out, and actually this guy had no excuse. It, was, it came out about 10 years later. I'll get to you in a minute. Um, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Ditlia wrote this book, Digital Deli. It was published by uh, Workman, and uh, his conclusion the last part of the book is a lot of articles collected from different people, not me, by the way, uh, but a lot, a lot of different articles, and this uh, actually appeared in that book, reprinted in it there. Uh, and he says, we can safely say, this is 1983, we can safely say computers will never be cheap. They will never be affordable. So here's a guy that supposedly knew had everything to draw upon. I'm not familiar with David Nimmons. Is he, is he somebody who otherwise was credible and respected? Yeah, he he wrote for the you know some some of the popular uh, um, science scientific. Uh, I, I don't know whether it was popular popular science or popular mechanics, but that type of magazine. Uh, not not in the computer field um, specifically. Um, okay. Moving along in 1983, here we have digital. Digital finally got their act together and they introduced the rainbow. The rainbow 100 rather. It was a, a neat machine, uh, dual processor, uh, and it had a Z80 and an 8086. Actually later on, a, uh, the later, I don't know, I don't recall what the 8086, anyway. Uh, so it could run both CPM and MS-DOS. Great, right? We all want a machine that can run both operating <laughs> systems, both leading operating systems. Do we? Well, maybe. Not too many people did. I mean, it was a it was a nice machine, but it was just so incredibly over-engineered and also too expensive. And the last thing with them, as I recall, maybe you were going to mention it, you had to buy your disk-guess formatted from the deck. Yes, you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the reason. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they were following in the good old Sony Betamax tradition. Uh, you've got to get it from us, because we know better. And, uh, it, we, we'll, yeah. Okay, let's look at the other end of the spectrum. We're looking at, at, at stuff that's too expensive. Too, okay, here we got <laughs> Mattel, the Aquarius, uh, and uh, and I can name a dozen like it. Uh, 
This was, uh, they described it as, uh, don't ask me where they came up with this slogan, but they called it a 70s machine in the 80s. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, and, you, and you pay your advertising agency for that, right? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> had, had, okay, there's another one like it, the new brain. Two, 2K, 1K, 2K of RAM. Uh, I mean, it was useless as a computer. Uh, we, even with the little mini expander and the joysticks and stuff, it, it, it enjoyed some popularity. All these did as, as little game machines. But these, these horrible uh, rubberized chiclet, uh, you know, uh, keyboards, uh, you know, you couldn't actually do anything uh, useful uh, with those. You know, video technology had one. Even Sinclair. Uh, I mean, Sinclair had some, some things going for it, uh, but uh, the keyboard just made them uh, not, not useful. Not useful at all. Um, okay, here's an interesting thing. I ranked all the advertisers of 1984 of which ones spent the most money, and this is this is not an order, uh, but these these are the uh, 30 uh, 32 advertisers that spent the most money in all of different computing publications, business publications uh, across the board in 1984. How many are around today? Well, I got to get back to Apple. Neck, IBM. Go a long way before we find another one. Radio Shack, uh, Microsoft, Texas Instruments. Seven or eight of them. Most of those aren't in computer anymore. That's right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with spending a lot of money on advertising. But uh, maybe if you had a good product to sell, uh, or uh, well, there's other things that uh, that are behind uh, uh, success. Uh, oh, did I have them? On? I'm sorry about that. Sorry. I, uh, uh, we know you don't have to show my mistakes. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning we're talking about lawyers. How many you need? How many operating systems do you need? Well, at this point, we really had, we were coming down, this is 84, uh, really coming down to, to two main dominant operating systems. You had the IBM PC uh, with the MS-DOS, and you had Apple. Uh, well, and then Macintosh, which was just released, but let's say at this point it was just the, the uh, IBM and, and Apple. And then what happened? Then we got 11, all of the key, electronics manufacturers in Japan band together and they said, we're going to beat you. We are coming up with an operating system that all of us agree to, MSX. And, and, and you can plug in programs on a cartridge and it will fit in every one of the computers. So you buy a cartridge, you can buy, you can, it'll go in an Oki Data or a Toshiba or, or a Sanyo or a Sharp or a Sony, it'll fit in every one of them and we'll have the same operating system. And here it is. And you know what? It's kind of like um, we have gasoline powered cars, we have diesel powered cars. Now along comes Subaru and they said, we have a kerosene powered car. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, that's nice. And then uh, along comes in Zuzu said, and we have a hydrogen powered car. So, you know, how many operating systems do you need? You didn't need MSX. And MSX, uh, the amount of money that they spend, this was just after they're coming off the fifth generation project, and I won't get into that, uh, but uh, we didn't need another operating system at that point. And MSX, uh, Succeeded in Japan for two or three years, and then it just uh, faded away, died off. Um, top, okay, leave this on. Uh, I, and this is not really a this is not really a blooper, but I just wanted to to uh, share with you in in 1984, December 84. This is 10 years into the computer field. 
Creative Computing uh, chose the top 12 computers, the top computer in 12 different categories. In uh, notebook portables, uh, inexpensive notebook portables, inexpensive de being defined under $2,500, uh, was the Sharp PC uh, 5000. Uh, I'm sorry, inexpensive was the, was the Radio Shack uh, 100. Inexpensive. The next level, the middle range, was the Sharp PC 5000, and then notebook portables, price is no object, was the uh, HP uh, portable. Um, desktop systems under $2,500, the TRS-80 Model 4, remember that one? All self-contained, two disk slots, nice machine. Uh, desktop system, 2000 to 4000 the IBM PC. Desktop system, price is no object, IBM PC AT, um, which, by the way, uh, just a little, little trivia, um, PCAT cost at that time this machine fifty seven hundred and ninety five dollars five thousand seven hundred and ninety five dollars. <laughs> it had five hundred and twelve k of RAM, a twenty megabyte hard drive, and a serial parallel port. No monitor, just for the computer and and the keyboard. Fifty seven ninety five uh, with five twelve k. Um, so. In light of that, we've come a long way. Uh, best transportable, uh, under $2,500, we, we selected the K-Pro2. Best transportable, uh, higher price, uh, the Compaq, Compaq Plus, um, which, by the way, uh, had 128K. Um, and uh, then the best home computer, under $500, Commodore 64. Uh, which had just come out. The runner-up was an interesting one. It was the Spectra Video 328. We, we thought that this thing from Hong Kong might uh, might take off. It never did. Some Sir. of your choices didn't take, take off, but did your choices, your preferences, have any effect on the marketing of the various computers? I doubt it. Other than some of them, uh, we, we, we allowed them to use kind of a little uh, seal of approval, like good housekeeping. Uh, it looked like a, a little gold foil thing with two ribbons. Uh, some of them did, some of them did. Most, most of them. I don't think it had any, any measurable impact. Uh, Byte would select uh, best computers, personal computing, all the magazines did. This was just ours. Dave, your knowledge was, was it 18? Was it the IBM PC the only uh, PC that used uh, TV basket dynamics brand? I'm sorry, I didn't catch all. Your knowledge was IBM PC the only uh, only PC that used piggyback dynamic brands. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, okay, finishing up the list, home computers over $500. We selected the Apple IIe and this, the Apple IIc, which had just come out. Uh, we didn't think much of the IBM PC Junior, by the way, uh, but uh, that, for a variety of reasons that we don't have to discuss here. Uh, we, we, uh, we looked at educational systems. We were looking at low-end educational systems under $1,000 and concluded that there wasn't uh, one that uh, met uh, our qualifications. Uh, we, we didn't even select one. Uh, over $1,000, we said maybe an Apple IIe, but uh, that was really kind of stretching it. Um, now, a short list of, of uh, I was talking about brand name computers. IBM Compatibles had started to come out now, too, uh, in 1984. Uh, a short list of ones that didn't make it to 1986. So we're only talking about maybe 18 months. Um, we've got, uh, you can show them uh, one of them. Um, the Sanyo 555, this one, the Televideo uh, PC. Then we had the Zazian PC, I don't even remember that. Uh, ISM Express PC, Corona Data Systems, PB400, Applied Data Systems, Tava, uh, Columbia 1600, Zenith Data Systems didn't make it. And, the, and even the, I, the HP 150 uh, Model 2, which wasn't quite PC compatible. So that, you know, if you're not quite compatible, you really got a problem. Uh, okay, hit the next one, please. Um, 
two, uh, two shots of, of creative computing. Our first issue in November 1974, I had a circulation of 520 when, when I started the magazine. Uh, and that was people that I went to National Computer Conference and sort of bribed to, to take a subscription. Um, <laughs> And then the last issue in December 85, the circulation was 475,000. Now, the reason I show this is this, this is a decision or a blooper that, that uh, of course, I'm very near and dear to my heart in a way, um, that Ziff Davis made. In 1985, uh, which is, uh, well, 84, they purchased uh, Creative computing uh, from from me. We had a group of five magazines, actually, including Microsystems, which is Saul Saul Leaders magazine, um, and uh, several others. And they came to a corporate decision that the home market was saturated. There was no further growth to be had in the home computing market, and they killed all of their home-oriented magazines and uh, only kept PC, uh, Apple user, and the new one that they had just started, <coughs> Mac user. And that was, that was it. And then they started a, several ones related to the PC, PC Week and, and, and uh, others, but they were all corporate oriented because the home market was saturated in 19, uh, 1985. So, uh, sorry if you bought a computer since then. I mean, you're <laughs> uh, whatever. Uh, Ziff Davis didn't believe it. Now, um, okay, I'm sort of uh, running, running out, huh? Yeah, I'm going to wrap, wrap up. I'll just mention one last thing. That, that's the 10 years. Uh, after, I, uh, after I finished up with uh, creative computing, uh, Ziff bought it. I was uh, without a job. Atari approached me and said, well, we have this wonderful new computer. And, and would you publish uh, or take over our magazine for it, Atari Explorer? Uh, some of you might uh, remember Atari Explorer. Um, we did publish it. By the way, uh, in, in some respects, Atari Explorer is a better magazine uh, than Creative Computing because uh, when Ziff Davis took sort of the reins of Creative Computing in the uh, uh, mid '80s, they started exercising a lot of editorial control over it. And uh, Atari uh, kind of let us loose. So we, we, had, we had more fun, really, with, with Atari Explorer and ran some interesting applications. But there was a really good example at Atari. Atari, with the 520X, uh, 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 what is it, ST, and the 1040 ST, those were good machines. Those were really, really good machines. Uh, so was the Amiga. The Amiga was a really excellent machine. But another operating system. We yeah. just plain didn't need it. We don't need an Atari operating system and an Amiga operating system. Atari's biggest mistake, biggest single mistake was their machine could run uh, PC programs. And in fact, the uh, third party manufacturers brought out uh, uh, software and, and a little hardware attachment. It could run, most importantly, Apple programs. If Atari had simply Gone to Apple and said, "We'd like to produce a clone. We'd like to have the Atari ST recognized as a clone for the Apple, uh, and paid them a little license fee. Atari would be around today, absolutely, a guarantee, because nobody's producing a good clone of the Apple, right? Uh, pardon? It's because of Apple. Well, except that Apple at that time, at that time, would have agreed to it. In '84, would have agreed to it because they were getting." beaten down by the IBM PC and the PC clone. And, well, well Sam Trammell and, and, uh, and uh, Jack Trammell, the owners of, of Atari, I mean, they just had a, a mindset of everything's for me, 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 me. Um, when they finally got buried by Nintendo in uh, 1990, uh, Atari kept going for the next five years. You know how they kept going? They sued people. Uh, that were infringing on their various patents, their various video game patents, for five years. They, they were like the first patent trolls. Yes. Are they, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the Amiga and the, uh, the Atari ST, I mean, they were fine computers if they had just <laughs> had bowed to the inevitable, we, can't have, we don't need another operating system. Uh, but they didn't. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
Come see me if you want to buy an old computer. <laughs>